This video is going to be very long, and I've seen other channels talk about Pletus or some other artists, but I'm really passionate about are the artists under Pletus, so I wanted to tell their story and explain why I despise the company, even though some of my ultimate groups are from this company. The way I'll be making this video is I'll first go over most of their artists and their careers, uh, one at a time so it won't confuse you guys as much. And then at the end, I'll be talking about everything that Pletus did wrong and what I think. The reason why I'm going to be going over most of the group's careers is because I want everyone to see how Pletus gave up on them and also show you guys the pattern that Pletus was following with all these groups. So strap in, let's go on a bumpy ride that is Pletus Entertainment. Pletus Entertainment was founded back in 2007 by Han Song Hoon. When he created the company, he brought along with him two artists, Park Kahi and Son Dambi. In the beginning of the company, it didn't really have anything besides a practice room for the idols, now known as the dungeon or the green room. I won't talk too much about Son Dambi in this video because I really couldn't find much about her while she was under Pletus Entertainment, but she did debut in Korea in 2008 with her first mini album. The next step for Pletus was debuting their first school group. This group was After School, and they debuted in January of 2009. Pletus announced that the girls would debut as a group that was very influenced by the Pussycat Dolls. The group was set up to have a graduation system so the idols could leave at any time to focus on other things instead of being stuck in a seven-year contract. But this ended up being a huge part of why the group had a major downfall later in his career. The group was formed by Kahi and the CEO of Pletus. Kahi had been a part of a Korean-American group called Esplush before she joined Pletus. So she suggested that Becca, a trainee Kahi had known while she was in Esplush, would join the group. After that, three other girls were added, Jonga, So Young, and Juyeon. With these five girls of the original lineup after school, they were ready to debut. The girls released their debut album on January 15th of 2009. The album was called New School Girl and it had three songs on it, Ah being the lead single. <laughs> the same day the teaser for Ah was released, it gained over 100,000 views, which back then was pretty impressive. The girls promoted their title track and had also planned on promoting another track of the album called Bad Guy, but it ended up being banned from broadcast because of one curse word in the lyrics. Later that year, in April, the first new member, Ui, was added and shortly after that they had their second single, Diva, released. <laughs> In the same month, the girls won a Ricky of the Month award. In July, the girls collabed with Sondambi for a digital single called Amoled. I hope I'm saying that right. I'm not, probably. It was a part of a promotional deal with Samsung. On top of that, After School and Sondambi had become an opening act for the Pussycat Dolls in their Asian dates of their tour. But it finally happened that a member would leave after school. Not even a year after their debut, So Young left the group in late October to focus on acting. But with that, two new members were added into the group, Nana and Reina. A month later, on November 25th, the girls released a single called Because of You. This comeback was the moment where the girls finally gained recognition. The album had over 30,000 pre-orders and the girls won three Mewdi Sen awards in SBS Inkigaya due to their sudden popularity. The year 2010 started off with a bang, pun intended, where the girls won two Best Rikis of the Year award at Billboard Japan Music Awards and the Soul Music Awards. Two months later, on March 25th, they came back with their third single, Bang, along with a new member called Lizzie. Bang had a marching back concept. Kahi had said that she wanted to do a concept like that since she joined after school. It took five months for the girls to learn the drums for the choreography. 
Bang ended up being number two on the Gaiyang Weekly chart, and at the end of the year, it was number twenty nine on the Gaiyang Year End chart, with two point three million digital downloads. In June, three of the girls from after school, Reina, Nana, and Lizzie, made a subunit called Orange Caramel. Orange Caramel went for a more happy and sweet concept, opposite of what a lot of other girl groups were doing at the time. They made their debut in June sixteenth with the title track "Magic Girl," and they were an instant commercial success. <laughs> Orange Caramel came back in November with her second mini album with the title track "Aying." The album peaked at number ten, and the title track peaked at number five. After School ended the year by releasing a Happy Pledis first album, where the portion of the profits were made from the album would be going to an organization called Save the Children. In January of 2011, Pledis announced that they had signed a contract with Avix Tracks, a Japanese recording label for After School. This meant that the girls could start promoting in Japan. The girls started off with a collab with a Japanese superstar called Nami Amuro. With a song called "Make It Happen." On top of that, the group now had a new member called Eeyong. In March, Bangkok City was released by Orange Caramel as a part of the group's One Asia project, a single that peaked at number three, making it the most popular single for Orange Caramel to date. <laughs> The girls went back to Korea to release and promote their first studio album called Virgin. The album was released in April 29th with the title track Shampoo. They also promoted another song of the album called Let's Step It Up with an impressive tap dancing in the choreo. But in mid June, Pledis announced that after the promotion of Virgin, Becca would be leaving the group. Then in July, the girls made a comeback, but this time they were split into two subunits: After School Red and After School Blue, and the two groups would promote two different songs. Orange Caramel continued their One Asia project with the single Shanghai Romance in October, and it peaked at number eight on the charts. Baby, show, 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 I'm not your show. After School then officially had their debut in Japan with Bang, then released a second single Diva and a new song called Ready to Love. Yet again, at the year, they ended up with an album where the portion of the proceeds went to charity, this time to UNICEF. This album was called Happy Pledis 2011, and it included After School, Son Tambi, and as well as trainees under Pledis at the time. Those trainees would later become parts of groups like Newest, Seventeen, and Pristin. After School started 2012 off with their third Japanese single with two title tracks, "Rambling Girls" and a Japanese remake of "Because of You." In March, they released their first Japanese album, "Play Girls." The album had both original Japanese songs as well as Japanese versions of their Korean songs. It is estimated that on the first day of the album's release, it had around 11,000 sales. Then After School kicked off their tour called "Play Girls" in April. Having four tour dates to promote their new album in Japan, it was announced on June fifth that Kahi would be leaving the group. So her last performance with After School was on that tour. She did stay until September to help the girls with promotions, but she wasn't part of any stages or such. It didn't take the girls too long to come back to Korea with a comeback with their fourth, fifth Korean single album called Flashback. In this comeback, the group had a new member called Kaun. This was the first time that the girls of After School would be promoting without Kahi. Orange Caramel had their Japanese debut with a cover of a song called "My Sweet Devil" in September, and then returned to Korea. There, they released their first studio album called Lipstick that same month.
The girls started gaining fame in other countries. They had fan meetings in countries like Thailand and Taiwan in 2013. And they even released a compilation album in March called The Best of After School, as well as a DVD of their tour in Japan. Orange Caramel also released their first Japanese studio album called Orange Caramel in March of 2013. On June 13th, After School had their last Korean comeback with their sixth maxi single, First Love. Just like previous comebacks, they showed a new skill that they had picked up, this time it being pole dancing, which added a lot of finesse to the choreography. And this is the reason why it is one of my favorite songs by After School. They had their fifth single in Japan called Heaven released in October and they sold over 18,500 copies in the first week of its release. And two months later, they had another Japanese comeback with Shush. In March of 2014, After School had their second full-length Japanese album, Dress to Kill. They released three versions of the album and had new songs as well as old songs in Japanese. For example, a Japanese version of Flashback. Early that year, After School filmed a show for KBS called After School Beauty Bible. The show let members try out becoming beauty editors, along with giving viewers info and tips on Korean beauty and trends. The show gained a lot of popularity, and they ended up getting a second season that was aired in September of that same year. In March, Orange Caramel released their third and probably most known song, Catalina. The song peaked at number four on the Gaon album chart and number six on the digital tar- charts, and at number four on the Billboard's K-pop Hot 100. <laughs> As the group promoted, they gained a lot of attention for the live version of the song. In May, they released a promotional single called A Bing A Bing. The song was used to promote a new ice cream line, the Baskin Robbins. At the end of the year, A Bing A Bing ended up number 12 on Billboard's list of the top 20 K-pop songs of 2014. In August, Orange Caramel came back with their fourth single, My Copycat. The theme of the comeback was Where's Waldo? <laughs> In both the music video and live stages, you can see Pledis trainees before they debut later in 17 and Princeton. A second Japanese tour was kicked up in late November of 2014 called Dress to Shine, and it ended the same month. On December 31st, it was announced that Ji Yun's contract had ended, and she would be graduating from the after-school group the same day, although she was still signed under AVEX tracks, so she would still be promoting with after-school in Japan. After this, things started slowing down for after-school. They released a music video for their Japanese song Shine in February of 2015 to promote their Japanese compilation album called Best, and Ji Yun officially left the group in March of that year. Nothing was heard from the group for almost a year, and then the group basically just fell apart. In January of 2016, Pledis announced that Jung would be leaving. Some of the remaining members started focusing on solo activities, like acting and starring in variety shows. Reina started her career as a solo artist back in 2014, but started focusing more on it now that the group had was not promoting together. In May of 2017, Pledis announced that Uyi had left the group, leaving only five members left in after school. In May of 2018, it was announced that Lizzie would be leaving after school, although Pledis also said that she would still be a part of Orange Caramel. Just a few days later, it was announced that Khan would be joining a new season of Produce 48, but she didn't make the final cut for Ison. I will, this, I will mention this more in the second part of the video, so keep that in mind. Khan left after school in July of 2019, and Reina left in December of 2019. Lee Young also left the company and the group in December. As of right now, Nana is the only member left of After School and Orange Caramel. 
Although during a conference this year after Big Hit acquired Pledis, all of the artists under Pledis were shown on the screen, but After School was not listed as a group, so people are assuming that the group has disbanded and is not coming back. The next group, Pledis Entertainment, debuted with Newest. Newest had five members from debut, JR, Aaron, Beko, Minhyun and Ren made their debut on March 15th in 2012 with their first for single, Face. The song got over 196,000 downloads. Doing super well hitting at number 15 on the Melon Charts and becoming the most viewed K-pop debut of all time back then. They had a comeback with their first EP called Action in July of 2012. The rest of the year, NOS began to expand their global marketing by holding events in Australia, Japan, and other countries in Asia. They were also one of the groups to perform at KCON 2012 in the US that year. They made their second comeback with their EP Hello in February of 2013. This was a huge shift from their two first albums. Same day the EP was released, they had an exclusive concert called Showtime Newest Time. <laughs> Although the song was received well by the Korean public, newest fans were not happy with the sudden concept change and their album sales started going down. Later in the year, on August 22nd, they would come back with their third EP called Sleep Talking, changing their concept yet again, but fans were not enjoying it. The album failed to chart at all, unlike the three previous albums they had released. In October, Pledis joined the Weihua Entertainment to try to branch out to the Chinese market. They announced that Newest will be forming a unit called Newest M. The lineup was the same original five members of Newest, plus a Chinese trainee from Weihua called Jason. The group recorded two songs, Face and Sleep Talking, both in Chinese. <laughs> The two companies had a press conference where Newest M performed together for the first time. But this didn't last long as the contract with Pledis and Weihua ended in 2014 and Jason left. There has been no mention of the subunit after this. A little less than a year later, the boys released their first full album called Rebirth, with the title track being Good Bye Bye. yet again failed to chart and sold even less copies than their previous albums. They decided to cut their promotion of Rebirth short and send them to Japan, where in the same year, in November, they had their Japanese debut with the single Shalalala Ring. At the beginning of 2015, February 27th, Newest released a digital single called I'm Bad, and then came out limited edition fiscal releases in March to celebrate their third debut anniversary. Beko was not a part of this title track since he had to undergo cord pileups surgery. I hope I'm saying that right. Boys got to hold their first solo showcase in North America in Dallas of May 3rd with the help of My Music Taste. Later that same month, they released their second Japanese single, Na 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 Namida. In November, they released their first Japanese studio album, Bridge the World. In February of 2016, they came back with their fourth Korean EP, Q Is. Then in August, they released another album called Canvas with the title track Love Paint. (laughs) 
That album sold less than 3,000 copies during the promotion period. The boys even held a fan sign with a limit of 100 people, but only 70 people showed up for it. After four years of being a group, they got their first music show nomination on the show, but they didn't end up winning. With the group's popularity slowly winding down and no comebacks in sight, it was the belief that the group was about to disband. Their last effort was for J.R. Becko, Minhyun and Ren to join a second season of Produce 101 in 2017. Because of the show, they started gaining a lot of love, and their two latest albums started charting, as they gained a lot of new fans. Minhyun ended up making the top 11, meaning that he would be debuting in a temporary group called 101, but the fans wanted newest back, so it was decided that while 101 was under promotion, a subunit called Newest W would be made. Due to the sudden popularity of the show, the boys decided to promote their single Hello Again, and they ended up ranking number 11 on Inkigayo. The boys started getting brand deals, appearing in variety shows, and so much more. Newest W made their debut with their EP W Here, with a title track of Where You At on October 10th, 2017. Where you at? Just a few days into their promotion, they got their first win on Music Bank. Newest W was the fourth K-pop group to ever sell over 200,000 copies in one week, and they were only subunit to have done that. In June of 2018, they had a comeback with their second EP, Who You, and they promoted a title track of the name Deja Vu. <laughs> They topped three different Korean music charts with Deja Vu, and in November they got an official platinum certification from Gaon Chart for reaching 250,000 album sales. Later that same month, on November 26th, New SW released their final EP called Wake N, with the title track of Help Me. Again, they topped the music charts in Korea and had a win on Music Bank in early December. The group disbanded when Minhyun joined the group again. Over their short career, Nui's W won a lot of awards, such as the Artist of the Year at the Asian Artist Awards, two Bong Sangs for W Here and Who You at the Golden Disc Awards, and so much more. They had fan meetings, mini concerts, and a concert in Asia called W. The five boys reunited at the beginning of 2019 and released a digital single called A Song For You to celebrate their seventh year since debut. They had their first solo concert in six years called Segno in April with the audience of 36,000 people. Later that same month, they came back as a group with their sixth EP, Happily Ever After, with the title track, Bet, Bet. They peaked at number one in Korea and number eight in the US, selling over 270,000 copies. In May, the boys released a song called The Blessing, which was an option for a debut song back in 2012. This comeback of Happily Ever After was a huge milestone for them, as this was the song that gave them their first ever broadcast win as a whole group, and they ended up winning on all five major music broadcasting shows. October came around and they gave out their seventh EP, The Table, with the title track Love Me. Then the group took a while to come back and in the May of 2020 they released their eighth EP called The Nocturne with the title track of I'm in Trouble. This comeback also did very well, selling 196,000 copies in Korea and 7,700 copies in Japan. As of right now, the latest thing Newest has done is released a second Japanese album called Drive. This was the group's first time releasing anything for Japan since their first Japanese album, Bridge the World. <laughs> Stay
Starting in 2013, trainees in Pleda started making live broadcasts called 17 TV. They had multiple seasons where trainees were introduced, seen practicing, and such. Sometimes they would have mini concert for their small fan base and to draw in more audience before their debut. They also had a reality TV show on NBC that was started in May of 2015 called 17 Project, Big Debut Plan. And the show ended with the boys debuting. 17 had their debut on May 26th with a live showcase on NBC following their reality show. The members of 17 are S. Koops, Jung Han, Joshua, Jun, Hoshi, Wonu, Uzi, DK, Mingyu, The Eight, Sengguan, Vernon, and Dino. 17 were the first male idol group to have a one hour live showcase on a major broadcast station. Three days later, their first EP, 17 Carat, was released digitally, and it became the longest charting K pop album of the year in the US. And their album was also the only rookie album to appear on the Billboard 10 Best K-Pop Albums of 2015. Since Seventeen have been doing pretty well since debut, I'm only going to be running over their careers quickly and then we're going to be discussing Seventeen in more detail later on in the video. Seventeen had their first comeback with Boys B and the title track, Manse. <laughs> They won multiple awards of that year, from the Golden Disc Awards, Soul Music Awards, and Gaon Chart K-Bum Award. In April of 2016, they released their first full-length album, Love and Letter, with the title track of Pretty You. With this song, they won their first ever music show win. In July, they repackaged the album, adding a few more songs and added a title track, Very Nice. Just after promotion of that album, they ended up kicking off their first Asian tour, Shining Diamonds. In December, they released their third mini album, Going 17, with the title track, Boom Boom, winning a lot of end of year awards as well as Music Soul Awards. <laughs> In 2017, Seventeen held six concerts in Japan, even though they hadn't even made their official debut in Japan yet. Their fourth Korean EP, All One, was released in May, peaking at number one and selling over 330,000 copies by the end of the year. This comeback helped them break into the mainstream market of K-pop. They got their first ever world tour called Diamond Edge, where they went to 13 different countries and ended their last concert date on October 6th. Just a month later, the group came back with their second full-length album, Teenage. <laughs> The boys didn't wait long until they released a repack in February of 2018. The album had the title Director's Cut and they had a title track called Things. In March of 2018, three of the boys from Seventeen, Sing Gwan, DK, and Hoshi, formed a unit called Busok Soon a name they had been known for as the gag tree of the group since their debut. They released a song called Just Do It on March 21st and promoted the song as a unit. Finally, in March of that same year, the boys had their Japanese debut with a mini album We Make You with the title track Call Call Call. Two months later in July, they came back with their fifth Korean mini album called You Make My Day. This 
also had another concert in Asia called Ideal Cut. January of 2019, the boys released their sixth mini album, You Made My Dawn, with the title track Home. The song was very popular, winning 10 times in different music shows in Korea. They ended up having their first Japanese comeback in May with their single Happy Ending. In June of 2019, they announced their new tour, Ode to You, and they started it later that year, but it got caught short in 2020 due to the pandemic. Seventeen released a digital single called Hit in August, and then followed it up with their third full-length album called Anode. The album sold over 700,000 copies in one week and gave the boys their first ever desang, also known as album of the year. In 2020, the boys gave out their third Japanese single, Falling Flower, selling over 400,000 copies in the first week and getting a first place spot in the Billboard Japanese Hot 100 chart. <laughs> In May, the boys had their YouTube documentary, Hit the Road, released that followed their journey on their tour on Ode to You. In late June, the boys came back with their seventh Korean mini-album called Hangare. They sold over a million copies in less than a week. The album did both well in Korea and globally. In September, they released their Japanese EP called 24 Hours, and in October, they came back with a special album called Semicolon with the title track Home Run. This album sold more than 1 million copies in pre-orders alone, so you can say that Seventeen have been doing pretty well ever since they debuted. In 2016, Pledis ended up sending some of their trainees to join the first season of Produce 101, and two of their trainees ended up making the final lineup of IOI that ended up debuting as a temporary girl group. Just like Seventeen, the trainees promoted themselves even before debut, holding weekly concert for a while under the name of Pledis Girls. They released the promotional single, We, which was actually written by some of the trainees. On January 6th, 2017, the girls had their last concert as Pledis Girls, announcing their group name, Priston. With IOI's disbandment, it was time for Priston to debut. They made their debut in March of 2017 with 10 members. Yuwa, Yehana, Kyolkyung, Siyeon, Onwoo, Roa, Rena, Sungyeon, Nayeong, and Kyla. Their debut album was called High Priston with the title track of We Woo. <laughs> They were doing pretty well for a rookie group. They joined the KCON Japan lineup in May and released a second single from their album called Black Widow before ending the promotion of High Preston. Later that same year, in August, the girls released their second mini album, School Out, with the title track We Like, that did just as well. In October, the company announced that Kyla would be taking a break to focus on her health. She returned to her home in the US, but sadly, she would never end up coming back to the group before they disbanded. Pristin was doing very well, winning Ricky Awards at the end of the year. Despite this, Pristin would never have a group come back, and Pledis basically went silent. That was until in May of 2018, when it was announced that Pristin would be making a subunit called Pristin V. The subunit had five members, Nayong, Roa, Onwu, Rena, and Kelkyang. They made their debut in May of 2018 with their album Like A V, promoting it with the song Get It. Kristen Wee was doing very well, gaining a lot of love for the song, but yet again, after the promotion, Pledis went silent. A year after Kristen Wee debuted, Pledis announced that Kristen and Kristen Wee had disbanded. Xion, Rena, Roa, Kyla, Nayeon, Yuha, and Eunwoo ended up leaving the company, while Kyung Kyung, Yehana, and Sungyeon ended up staying at Pledis.
Okay, so now we ha finally have all that out of the way, and we can move on, on to everything Pledis has done wrong to these artists. We're going to start with After School and move down the list. Also, before I start, I want to say that uh, things I'm going to talk about are not all confirmed, so just keep that in mind. The first thing I want to talk about in regards to After School is their concept. I get the idea behind it, letting your artist leave the group, apparently, when they want. This is also the downfall of the group. At first, it didn't affect the group too much, but when Becca and Kahi left, fans really started getting upset. We've seen it time and time again. When groups are changing their lineups, fans lose interest in the group, or people avoid the group because they don't want to get confused. The second thing Pledis did to fail after school was the sudden halt of Korean promotions. There's no reason why. Pledis saw that they were doing good in Japan and just forgot about Korea, and it caught up to them. If you listen to my whole ramble about their career, you could hear how they would jump between Japan and Korea as well as other countries. But then they just stopped focusing on Korean comebacks altogether. And that's why they ran out of Japanese content, because they had nothing left to translate over to Japanese songs. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that they didn't have any Japanese original songs, but they also always made their old Korean title tracks into Japanese songs. So, at the end, when you stop promoting in Korea, you're gonna end up with no more songs to turn into Japanese versions. It also didn't help that Orange Caramel debuted, um, and they started getting more popularity than After School. Uh, this is not their girl's fault at all, don't get me wrong, I blame Pledis. I bet the Pledis saw that Orange Caramel was doing so well, and they just put all their attention into the subunit, leaving the other girls in the dust. And on top of that, while after school was in a hiatus, all the girls basically weren't doing much. They were basically stuck with no promotion. The girls have all said that they wanted to have a comeback. Pledis just wouldn't give them one. Once uh, Orange Caramel was on a show back in 2014 and the topic of money and payment came up, there Reyna revealed that the members only got paid every six months. She said, quote, that's why we live like beggars. We live like we're well off for two months and then we live difficultly for the remaining four. This is what she said when she was asked about she felt about only getting paid every six months. She also added, I got about 7 million won or 6,700 US dollars, while Nana and Lizzie got about 10 million won each, 9,500 US dollars. As we are both in Orange Caramel and after school, we separate payments. The individual takes the profits from their individual activities. I do want you to keep in mind that this is a paycheck for every six months of hard work while they're in two different groups. When Kayan was on Produce 48, she revealed how she and her group mates were treated. Kayan said that she thought she might have had better chances as a trainee on Produce 101 Season 1 with the other Princeton girls rather than debuting in after school. The way Kayan talked made it seem like she hadn't been doing anything other than hanging around with other trainees instead of doing group activities which sounds mean, I'm not being mean, I'm just saying it sounds like she has nothing to do when she's just stuck at the company. She had waited for a comeback but got left in the dust by Pledis with her other groupmates. She also said that when the CEO allowed her to join Produce 48, she knew there was no hope for after school. <laughs> あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ
I hope he sees please look after my vanity too and comes to his senses. Another thing after school members had to deal with, with was not being allowed to use phones and not being able to get any sleep when they had comebacks and other struggles that idols deal with. Kahi went on a show called Taxi where she talked about her experience with after school and Pledis. She talked about some bullying rumors surrounding after school and she talked about her experience. Quote, After school started with five members originally, but then the company kept adding new members and that fact made the original members sad. Despite the ongoing conflicts, the company didn't listen to me. I was in charge of teaching all the new members, but when they went on variety shows, they would say that I'm scary. Nobody was on my side. I'm a woman and a singer of the company too. So I decided to leave. Before I said on a show that there was bullying in the group, but it was actually me who was bullied. She also said, quote, All what the original members wanted was the company's care for us. It felt like I cannot get along with the new members as friends. I always felt like I had to be the scary leader to them. Kahi even mentioned that she had voiced her concern to Pledis about the graduation system, but they didn't listen. She even gave up a solo contract with YG because of her loyalty to Pledis. Another former member, Becca, was in an interview after she left after school talking about her experiences. She talked about how the girls would basically get no sleep. Quote, the worst thing was not sleeping. We came home with an hour and 30 minutes left until the next activity. I had to wash off my makeup, shower, and I went to sleep. But by then, I only had 30 minutes to wake up again for 6 a.m. Now, I know they aren't the only group with crazy, insane schedules, but still, this is insanity, and I don't think idols should be overworked like this. Now, on to the way they treated Newest. Oh boy, where do I begin? Pledis would upload Newest's schedule late, so fans would not be able to make it to their different promotions. For example, for one of the schedules, fans had to take a bus to see them, and he would have to book the bus in advantage. But Pledis uploaded the schedule for that event after it happened. For an idol champion event, Pledis was 10 days late to let the fans know Newest would be joining. Or sometimes Pledis just wouldn't let fans know about events happening. For example, their Songbuto love sharing contest. They would post schedules and then change them or cancel them without any updates for the fans. The members of Newest would have to take public transport to get to broadcasting stations without a manager, which is very dangerous for idols. I don't think I need to explain why that is. As I talked about, Newest, just like after school, had to jump between countries. That meant they never had enough time in each country to make a stable fan base, and they would leave for long periods of time before coming back. I don't know why they thought it was a good idea to ship Newest after Japan and China, leaving fans in Korea with no content, when they were doing so well to begin with in Korea. Another example of Pledis not caring is when, during a fan event in Japan, there was so much physical contact allowed. Fans would touch the boys' faces, squeeze their cheeks, and would touch them all over. None of the staff did anything to stop this. Fans would ask for these poses, and newest members couldn't say no. One time, Becco's dad was in the hospital, and he was banned from speaking about it. The boys had 12-hour fan events with small breaks or no breaks at all, which meant they had to stand in the cold for hours on end meeting fans. Pledis would feed newest cheap and insufficient meals. Pledis wouldn't give newest outfits for promotion, and they had to use their own clothing on occasions. The company even stopped giving out official newest merchandise after 2013 until they got popular for produce, of course. Their Chinese debut was a shit show. They were not prepared, and they were made to work in poor conditions, but Pledis and Weihua have not said anything about it. There's a clip of JR before they got popular again where he was talking to his fans at a concert. He basically blamed himself for the group's failures, even though he had no part in it and it was basically Pledis' fault for not promoting them and managing them properly. I'm gonna play some clips for that concert so he can hear the pain in his voice as he takes the blame for Pledis' fuck-ups. I'm 
For the filming of their song Overcome, there was a scene where Minion was laying in the snow on the ground. The snow used on set that Minion was laying in was made of salt. Minhyun is allergic to salt. Like, who allowed this? What? Like, that's literally horrible. Now for Seventeen. Even though Seventeen are doing well since their debut, Pledis still treats them like trash. When Seventeen debuted, Pledis was going under because of the little funding, and Seventeen was basically the only group they were promoting at the time, meaning that Seventeen was the main source of income for the company. As I mentioned earlier, Seventeen was on a show before their debut where they had to do different challenges as a group and in different units. There are some things that both I and other fans take issue with. For example, that was the way the CEO treated Seventeen. If you're a fan of Seventeen, you might know about the rings they have been wearing since their debut. It's a symbol of their group and their love for each other to show that they're all together at Seventeen. What does the CEO do? Take their rings away from them just months after he gave them to them to become 17. When they get the rings back, it's so emotional as their parents come on the show to give them the rings back. That is literally just emotional torment. The premise of the show was basically you have to show us how badly you want it. How badly do you want to debut? The members were sent to different places and the challenges was for as many people to show up to cheer them on. But how are fans supposed to know where they're supposed to be if they post about their parents is so late? The CEO basically said, if you don't get enough people to show up in these random locations to cheer you on, you can't debut. The boys also had a meeting after one group challenge that didn't go too well for them. The boys were supposed to perform different dances that they had been learning since their trainee days. But the CEO scolded them because they couldn't remember real dances that they learned years ago. The way the CEO talked to them was horrible. It felt like you were watching an owner scold their dog. Moving on to their uh, debut and just after debut. In the early days of Seventeen, they weren't given any monitors to perform. The members asked for any monitors, but Pledis basically just said no. Pledis said that they would have to get them themselves, so members either had to reach out for their family for help or just wear headphones or nothing on stage at all. I'm not saying that every group and every member has to in in ears, but compared to other groups that debuted at the same time, most of them were wearing in ears while most of the 17 members had nothing. Another thing I mentioned earlier is that when they were trainees, they were live streaming their training and other activities they did in the green room. In this, there was an incident caught on camera where Wanyu was basically scolded for speaking in his native dialect. There's rumors of staff calling Singwan a pig and hitting him and telling him to lose weight. Fans accused staff of stealing gifts from Seventeen. On multiple occasions, fans would see things that they had given to members um, and staff would be wearing them or holding them or using them instead. They've also been accused of throwing out letters or gifts without even letting Seventeen know. Pledis is very bad at putting out statements, especially towards international fans. Some of the members have Instagram accounts, but all of a sudden they stop using them, so we can assume Pledis isn't allowing them to use them anymore. Because why would all the members stop using their accounts around the same time? Pledis would take 80% of their boys' profit that they make in Korea. That means that 13 members are left with 20% to split between them. And... It's horrible because a lot of idols have to deal with it, but it's even more horrible because the boys are self-producing idols. Staff has been heard talking badly about 17 members. Pledis would forget to include members in things. For example, in the Carolyn merch one year, they forgot to include Dino's name on shirts. They would forget to credit members for performances. Pre-debut, Hoshi was told to lose weight, so he would starve himself, crying himself to sleep. I found this comment online. I'm not saying it's definitely true, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, This is from someone that works at a broadcasting station. Quote, I work in a broadcasting station. When Seventeen was promoting Manse, they came to say hi to me. I asked them to take a picture and the main vocalist who wore a huge ribbon was like, I think I'll be scolded if I take a picture with a really apologetic face. Pledis is also known for treating members of Seventeen like June worse than other members. For example, when Seventeen wasn't as big, they went on a tour in Asia where one of the dates was Malaysia. But Pledis fucked up. June didn't have a visitor's visa and wasn't allowed into the country so he couldn't join the boys and had to sit in a hotel waiting for them for 24 hours alone. 
June released his first ever solo song, and Pledis decided to put out a teaser of Getting Close the same day and gave him basically no promotion for a single. They haven't even added his song to Spotify, while other members' OSTs are on the site. Pledis made him stop acting, even though he's passionate about it. Pledis' Chinese company, XCSS, almost never talks about June versus other artists like Minghao or Kyokyung. One time, Pledis posted a photo of the group and cut June out of the photo. They did get called out and they re-uploaded, but how does this happen? Not to mention lack of screen time in videos and poor, poor line distribution. In their YouTube documentary, Seventeen was often shown in a lot of pain, performing sick or injured. I know the members want to push through, but this is just heartbreaking and horrible to think that they feel like they have to do this. Condition的状况很好，提诺가없어서 오른쪽만 아플 때는 이제 왼쪽 발로 뭔가 유하게 뭔가 넘어가고 좀 했다면 갑자기 두쪽 다 아프니까 이게 다. Seventeen has on multiple occasions spoken out against Pledis, telling fans not to join Pledis. And Hoshi even mentioned in a speech at an award that he knows that fans don't like the CEO of Pledis on local TV in front of a bunch of fans. And lastly, Preston, poor Preston, were treated so horribly. They were doing so well, but Pledis just threw them to the side and gave up on them. On top of that, we were not giving any given any updates between we like and get it and they did the same thing until the group was disbanded they had no reason to do that at all they shipped kyokyung to china and now she's just working over there as an idol when fans started mocking and attacking one of the members kyla for what for her weight what did they do nothing until mental health was so bad that she had to take a break from the group and never ended up coming back there are even people that blame kyla for the group's disbandment which is just absurd she was getting so much hate from the day they debuted. Kyla was only 15 years old, but Pledis just couldn't be bothered to protect a child, a literal child. When pictures of Roa came out of her drinking underage, Pledis did nothing. When the fans got angry that Kyokyung was working so much in China and they voiced that, Pledis again did nothing. Pledis is bad at managing. They're bad at what they're supposed to be doing. They can't give out statements for things they have been accused of. They can't credit their own artists. They can't credit things they have sampled. And they suck at giving idols what they deserve when they have worked so hard for it. Xi'an, a member of Pristin, was with Pledis for 11 years. And they treat her like this. And same with a lot of other idols of theirs. They are so loyal to Pledis, but they won't give them an ounce of respect. And this is just a part of what Pledis has done. There are so many more things they have done. And I just, I can't put it all in this video. I'm not saying that Pledis has not done anything good for their groups. But I still think Pledis is a horrible company. One thing that does give me a bit of hope is that Big Hit has now acquired a large part of Pledis. And now they're the majority shareholder of the company. They will now receive final support from Big Hit and expertise support while they will still operate as their own label. So 
even though Pledis is still a thing, I am hoping that they will get better under Big Hit, but I guess only time can tell. Uh, thank you so much for watching my video. I know it's so long, but this is something I'm super passionate about. Um, if you have any comments or you want to talk about it, you can, you know, we can talk down below. All of my sources and all the videos I used will be linked in the description. And yeah, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye.